The opposite of sin is faith, in which one responds, you might say, appropriately to the call that comes to one. So faith is a kind of response. Faith is a passion. It requires grace. It requires divine assistance. Besides Jung, the thinker that most deeply inspired my attitude as an analyst and perhaps as a human being is the Danish philosopher, psychologist, and Christian Søren Kierkegaard. A few years ago, I was lucky to pick up a book titled Søren Kierkegaard's Christian Psychology, Insights for Counseling and Pastoral Care, written by Professor C. Stephen Ewens. Researching the author, I quickly found out that Professor Ewens is one of the world's leading experts on Søren Kierkegaard and has also published extensively on subjects including philosophy of religion and the relationship of psychology and Christianity. Dr. Anders is University Professor of Philosophy and Humanities at Baker University. He is also a professorial research fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Society at the University of Notre Dame in Sydney, Australia. His last book is Kierkegaard and Spirituality, Accountability as the Meaning of Human Existence. I wanted to invite Dr. Evans to speak about how Kierkegaard's writings can be understood as a unique form of Christian depth psychology. Okay. So many of the listeners to this podcast are familiar with and interested in psychoanalysis and union psychology and such, and, and some of them are also working with patients. So I would like our conversation today to ambulate around your writing in relation to um, Kierkegaard as a, as a depth psychologist, because I know in, in your book uh, that you published in 1990, Søren Kierkegaard's Christian Psychology, Insights for Counseling and Pastoral Care, you do present Kierkegaard as a depth psychologist of sorts. So I was wondering if we maybe could just start there in, in what form you would speak of Kierkegaard as a psychologist that works in depth. Well, I, yeah, that's a great question. It seems to me that for me, a, a depth psychologist in part just means that you have the view that the human self is indeed deep. <laughs> and what that means is that we are not transparent to ourselves. We don't necessarily know ourselves. Know, knowing yourself is at best a lifelong task, not, not something that is simply achieved by being conscious or, you know, turning one's introspection of gaze on one's psyche or something like that. So I think Kierkegaard shares with, say, Nietzsche and Freud and, and Jung and, and perhaps many other thinkers this sort of perspective that there's more to ourselves than we know. And sometimes what we don't know about ourselves is what we might call motivated, motivated ignorance in that there are things about ourselves we would rather not know or, or we, we would like to block from our conscious awareness. So I think in general, Kierkegaard fits into that sort of category as that type of, of psychological thinker, although he has, he has some definite differences from Freud. Well, Freud, I think, would say that we are basically at bottom biological creatures. Kierkegaard by no means denies that we are biological creatures, but he thinks that we are fundamental spiritual beings. By that, he doesn't mean that we're ghosts or anything like that, but but that we we have a fundamental sort of drive to to find meaning and significance mm. and 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 selfhood for him is a kind of quest it's a kind of achievement in which we are seeking to become the person that in some sense we already are but we have not yet become so you could say the motto this is interesting one of the things that both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche there's a quote that from both of them that I don't think Nietzsche never hmm. read Kierkegaard, so he didn't get it from Kierkegaard, but both of them are willing to say, our, our task is to become the person we are, become whom you are. So I think that's, that's one way of summarizing Kierkegaard's view. But, but he would be like, more like someone like, say, a Viktor Frankl, uh, hmm. who's logotherapy, who thinks that the self that we need to become has to be understood in relationship to these sort of spiritual needs and and uh, that are that are in some sense, although they're not by a lot, they they are in some sense fundamental mm. to the self. 
that leads me to, to this question about the human being as a spiritual creature. Perhaps you could help us to unpack those famous introductory lines of sickness unto death. Not all of them, but maybe this one. Man is a spirit, but what is spirit? Spirit is the self, but, but what is the self? So what is the self in the Kierkegaardian view? How does he view the human self? Yeah, though, that's a great question. Those are indeed very, I've taught that book many times and students often find those passages extremely baffling and, and difficult, but I, I think they are actually aren't as difficult as they appear at first glance. Part, part of what's going on there is when Kierkegaard says we are a self and we're a spirit is saying that the, the self is a work in progress. It's an achievement, not simply a substance to think of sort of biological categories or Aristotle's categories or Descartes. The self is not simply a thing, mm. but in some sense, it's, an act, it's, it's made through an activity. And the second thing I would say about it is that the, the, the components of the activity turn out to be, in, in a sense, paradoxical. Because Kierkegaard wants to say, the self is, on the one hand, we are bodily creatures, we are temporal creatures, we're born at a certain time, a certain place. There's much about the self that is fixed, that's necessary, that we have to come to terms with. At the same time, as a self-conscious being, we have this ability to project an ideal, a future, to think in terms of possibilities. And so possibilities, so our task in some way is to synthesize the possible and the necessary and, and become this person we are. So that, that's part. The other thing that goes on in that passage mm. is that he contrasts two, two ways one might think of the self. One way is you, you carry out this activity, you relate yourself to yourself. That is, you relate the self that you are to the self you might say you would like to be or, or mm -hmm. you think you could become. But you do that all by yourself. It's a kind of autonomous, self-enclosed. And I think the Sartrean version of existential psychology is a bit like that. Sartre seems to think that the self is completely a kind of self-made project. Well, Kierkegaard, although this is surprising because he has a reputation for being a, quote, individualist. Kierkegaard thinks that when we become a self, we are never totally isolated or individual. Rather, we become the self we are always in a social context, in relationship to other selves. Even our own self-ideal that we're conscious of, those possibilities, we don't generate those out of nothing. They come initially for him from our parents, from our society, and he thinks ultimately from God who allows us to transcend what you might say, our parents or our society. So God is very important for Kierkegaard because God is what allows us, in a sense, to rise above merely being a product of, of, our, of our upbringing or our past. Well, that makes me wonder, honestly, here, the ideas that, that Kierkegaard developed around the self and this definition that you're helping us to sort of ambulate around, when did, what was his inspiration then? What was his inspiration for? I mean, is this just his sort of genius or, or where did he, did he find inspiration in other thinkers in this definition of the self, defining the self in this way? Yeah, well, I think, I think that, uh, first of all, I think he was a genius. <laughs> he himself, he speaks, he, he says he was, quote, a genius in a market town. <laughs> That, that he felt unappreciated. But I think he was inspired even by people he fundamentally disagreed with. For example, I think his conception of spirit is partly related to Hegel because Hegel sort of took the notion of, of, of God or spirit or whatever, which he'd inherited from the tradition. And he says, Hegel says, we mustn't think of spirit only as substance, but also as subject. And by that, he means that the self must be thought of as a dynamic unfolding process, not just an entity or, or a thing. I think Kierkegaard sort of absorbed that lesson from Hegel, but instead of applying it to world history or, you might say, the world spirit, Kierkegaard applies it to the human self, mm. to the individual. But other sources of inspiration for Kierkegaard would include certainly the Bible. He's a deep, deep reader of, of the uh, Bible, including the Hebrew Bible. 
more so than most Lutherans, he uh, he is very fascinated by Old Testament writings and stories. He mm -hmm. writes about Abraham, he writes about Job, and uh, other figures of that sort. But secondly, I think he was deeply influenced by Luther yes. himself and by Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, I often read Kierkegaard as a kind of Christian Augustinian, and Augustine is sometimes himself seen as a kind of forerunner of existentialism because of his uh, confessions where he it more or less invented the idea of, of the, the memoir, the personal account of one's life and how I became the self that I am. And I think Kierkegaard was very deeply shaped by, 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 by Augustine and, and many other thinkers, mm. evil thinkers, mystical thinkers, pietist thinkers. There, there are many, many, many sources of influence, but, but certainly there's a strong element of genius in that. He, when he almost everyone he reads, he reads in his own original way. Kierkegaard hmm. himself talks about this. He says that some people are so intellectually, you might say, strong that they're almost incapable of reading people as the people were meant to be read or wanted to be read. They always read them, you might say, in, in light of their own their own thoughts, their own thinking. And I think Kierkegaard attended that direction. Hmm. Well, in the beginning of the book, so in Kierkegaard's Christian Psychology, you, you write that, of course, Kierkegaard was a philosopher, he was a psychologist, but you remind us that his primary mission, and that he's best to be understood as a missionary to the pagans in Christendom. C could, could you speak a little bit about the relationship between the missionary and, and the psychologist? Sure. And how does it yeah. yeah, I'd be glad to do that, yeah. Kierkegaard is, a, as as most people know, was a very sharp critic of what he called Christendom. The heart of Christendom is the idea that one becomes a Christian simply by growing up in a Christian society or a Christian culture. That simply Christianity is something one absorbs from one's nurture, from one's upbringing, and therefore, if if one is brought up in a Christian society, one will be a Christian, and it's something that one can more or less take for granted. And Kierkegaard strongly thinks this is contrary to the New Testament and contrary to a biblical Christianity. And so he thought that Christendom was a kind of it was a kind of deception because genuine Christianity always requires a kind of personal, authentic commitment. And if you think that you're already a Christian just by virtue of how you've been raised, then in a way you're blocked from Christianity. And so he says Christianity is almost Real Christianity has almost died out, and my task is to, quote, reintroduce Christianity into Christendom. So I want to help people who think they already are Christians understand what real Christianity is so that they have a chance of becoming. Because a genuine Christian is never simply at home with any worldly society or order, but always is capable of a critical stance. So uh, Kierkegaard thinks that genuine Christianity has a kind of radical character to it, in that if you really tried to love your neighbor as yourself, for example, as, as, as Christ taught to do, then you would find yourself at odds with much in, in any culture, including those cultures they claim to be Christian cultures in nature. So, so, so that's the idea, but but how does this relate to psychology? Well, here's how it does. Kierkegaard thinks the problem with Christendom in part is that it has a faulty view of the self. It doesn't really understand, here's the way to put it. Christianity is supposed to, for him, be an answer to what we might call the human dilemma, the human problem. But if you don't understand the problem, you won't understand the solution. And so, he says, I, I have to help my contemporaries wake up to what does it mean to exist as a human being? Because if they aren't asking those questions, they won't even be, you might say, on the right page for understanding Christianity. Kierkegaard here has a radical, you know, many people think that religion has declined in Western cultures. And they often think, well, it's declined because we've become more intelligent. We know more science. There's all this sort of historical, biblical criticism. It's all basically because Christianity is no longer intellectually dominating. Kierkegaard thinks that diagnosis of the decline of religion is just completely wrong. He thinks if religion is declined, it's not because we are intellectual giants, but because we are emotional, you might say, midgets, or, you know, we, 
we're underdeveloped in our understanding of the passions. Not that we're overdeveloped in our mind. There's no problem. He doesn't think there's any tension between Christianity and the highest level of intellectuality. But he thinks that merely knowing theological truths or knowing ethical truths in an intellectual way never makes you a truly authentic human being. What, what's important is how those truths are, are integrated into your life. And they're integrated into your life in your actions, and your actions reflect your passions. They reflect your emotions and what you love, what you hope, what you fear, what you care about. Mm. Moving forward and, and maybe into the clinical room in a sense, anxiety is something that we are addressing in the analysis or in the, in the psychotherapeutic rooms. And I was wondering if you could help us a little bit in unpacking Kierkegaard's view on anxiety and despair. Well, let's, let's, take, let's take them separately. Ah. Yeah, let's say something about anxiety first. Okay. Anxiety for Kierkegaard, let me say, I think he mainly is... Is not, he's not thinking about what I would call pathological anxiety. You know, you as a, as a psychoanalyst, you probably have dealt with many people who are obsessive compulsive, who can't leave the house without checking the door locks 10 times or washing their hands 30 times. I don't think that's what Kierkegaard has in mind when he talks about anxiety. He talks about anxiety more as part of the human normal condition. So there's a sense in which you wouldn't want to eliminate anxiety. It would be eliminating our humanness or our selfhood. Because for him, anxiety is a kind of awareness of freedom. And freedom is basic to the human self. So, in fact, he even in his book on the concept of anxiety, he tries to explain human sinfulness. Basically, he says something like this, that God gave humans freedom but in order to give them freedom, he gives them the capacity to rebel and become their own gods. They sort of, quote, try to lay hold of their freedom to make their own freedom the basis of the self, instead of seeing the self as something that is founded in something bigger than the self. Mm. So, so anxiety is part of the human condition, but it can be pathological. And some of, maybe some of that pathology is physiological in nature. Maybe it's connected to what goes on in chemicals or in the brain. But he also thinks that many times people have a kind of existential unhappiness or disorder because they're anxious about the wrong thing. He thinks that if you really want to live a full human life and in some sense a good human life, your life must not be such that it's built around finite things that are necessarily contingent and which may or may not happen. So suppose I'm terribly anxious because I really want a job, particular job. I'm applying for a job and I'm really anxious and I feel like if I don't get that job, my life is worthless. Well, for Kierkegaard, the real problem is that I've invested myself in something that won't bear the weight of selfhood because it's always going to be contingent whether I get that job or not. And we need an understanding of the self in which my, my life will still have meaning and purpose, whether I get the job or whether I marry the person I want to marry. And so he thinks that the, the, there's a push within the human self towards something transcendent, because mm -hmm. we need to find something that will bear the weight of selfhood and that is not subject to the kind of contingency. There's a little bit of a similarity here between Kierkegaard and ancient Stoicism. You know, the ancient Stoics wanted a view of life in which your life could still have value and meaning no matter what happened to you, whatever happened. And Kierkegaard is looking for, you might say, a kind of Christian counterpart to that kind of Stoic view. But there's one big difference between Kierkegaard and the Stoics. The Stoics thought that emotion was a big part of the problem. And that our task was to leave emotion behind and become purely rational. And then we would be at peace with whatever happened. But for Kierkegaard, we're not to become emotionless or passionless, but rather to acquire the right emotions, to love the right things, to hope for the right things, to fear the right things. So, for example, in the concept of anxiety, he says, 
He who has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. So it's not to get rid of anxiety, but to, so what I need to, to do is to work on being anxious. Of, am I being my true self? Am I, am I living in the way that I am meant to live? And then if, if, I, if, I'm, if I can say yes to that question, then I can have a kind of joy and a kind of happiness that in a sense will be there no matter what happens to me in, in the course of human life. Now, of course, this is backed up for him by what, what he might call, what we might call his Christian metaphysical view, just as the Stoic view was backed up by their metaphysics. The Stoic had this view that, that, that God was in some sense, they had a sort of pantheistic view of, of a God who was present in everyone and everything. And mm -hmm. so in a sense, it was all going to be for the best. Kierkegaard's view is, is quite different, but he thinks that if you have met God and, and understand that God loves you enough to become a human being, and die for you, then you realize what immense value you have, and that that value is something that no one can take away from you. So this is part of the huge appeal of, of Christianity for Kierkegaard is that it offers a, a kind of a kind of secure view of the self that is impervious to the kinds of accidental contingencies, and that that really does bring us towards despair if you want to move yeah. that way. Yeah. Because despair is, for Kierkegaard, not simply a feeling, although it is a feeling. We can feel despair. We can have the emotion of despair. But it's an emotion that discloses to us that we, our self is empty, that we, that we don't have a self, that there's, there's sort of nothing, that we haven't achieved the self that we were meant to be. And usually, very often, despair does take the form of trying to ground oneself in something that doesn't bear the weight of the self, something that is too, you might say, flimsy a basis. So that's a, that's a huge part of, of sickness under death. That, but for Kierkegaard, there is a kind of, this is part of the depth psychology that we repress our need for the spirit. For Freud, we often are repressing biological you know, desires for that are grounded in libido or sexuality and for Nietzsche, also biological, a need for power and domination. For Kierkegaard, there's this fundamental need for meaning and to see myself as having a kind of value and purpose. And surprisingly, you would think people wouldn't want to repress that, but they often do. They, they, they often wish to sort of speak, live their life at a very trivial and, and level in which they're just content with, well, I'm making a good living, or I have a nice house, or I'm driving a BMW car, or, you know, they're content with these sort of childlike toys, you might say, and they miss. And so at some level, they're aware of this, and that causes, there's a sort of glimmering awareness of despair. But people want to repress that because they, they don't want to undertake the painful task of becoming the self that they were meant to be, because it doesn't necessarily come easy. Mm. Could you say something also about how, how, how despair links to, to sin and Kierkegaard's view of that? Yeah. Now, one can be aware of despair and, and so on, but what Kierkegaard, we have, we have to here look at things from two different points of view. There's a sort of higher point of view. This is sort of the true, you might say, the true story about what's going on. But then there's the story of what the person understands of what's going on. And so I, I may be aware of, of this sort of need for meaning or hope. And really, from the higher point of view, this is God speaking to you. But many people don't realize that. They don't recognize that they have God's voice. And Kierkegaard says, in that case, you have despair, but the person is, quote, too spiritless to sin. <laughs> sin is a sort of spiritual malady. So in a way, being exposed to true Christianity is sort of dangerous, because then despair, he says, when you, have, when you realize that this call to meaning is a call from God, and you refuse the call, then you are sinning. 
because you are directly disobeying God. But that requires a kind of higher level of spiritual consciousness. So in one sense, he says, uh, if you look at ancient pagans before the coming of Christianity, he says paganism, in a way, was too spiritless to sin. <laughs> in another way, he says that was their sin, that they were repressing this need for spirit. But, but there is, uh, Kierkegaard often is fond of sort of paradoxical language and, and also what he calls dialectical accounts. So from one point of view, paganism can be viewed as not sinning because they are not spiritual enough. But from another point of view, you can see them as sort of repressing this awareness of spirit, which is in some sense part of human nature. And so, so despair, on his view, is sin, but it's only recognized as sin when one has this sort of higher, you might say, theological perspective on it. Mm. Mm. And I, I think you also write in your book there that, that Kierkegaard makes the point to identify that the opposite, opposite of sin is not virtue, but faith, he says. Why is it important for, for Kierkegaard to stress that the opposite of sin is not virtue, but, but faith? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And there's actually been quite a controversy in recent years among Kierkegaard scholars over whether or not Kierkegaard can be understood as a, quote, virtue thinker or virtue ethicist. And I think despite that quote from sickness unto death, the answer is Kierkegaard is a kind of virtue thinker in the sense that he thinks that there are, there are moral and spiritual qualities that are excellences that we ought to seek to achieve, particularly qualities like courage, faith, hope, love. But he doesn't use the word virtue for those qualities. So he avoids the term virtue. And I think the reason is for him, Kierkegaard attended, for example, a grammar school. It was called the School of Citizen Virtue, <laughs> translated from Danish to English. And the term virtue had come become sort of spoiled for him because it had been converted into a kind of bourgeois, middle-class respectability. Mm. And far from necessarily being authentic spirituality, you can be sort of outwardly respectable, in a kind of bourgeois way, never doing, you'd never think of stealing or, you know, cheating or anything like that. And you might even be a very self-righteous person, but, but that can be a way of, of closing oneself off. Because mm -hmm. notice that I can think, well, I myself can be a righteous, good person. But now that can be a kind of rebellion against this sort of call from transcendence. Because I'm saying, I don't need transcendence. I can do it all by myself, from within myself. And so the opposite of sin is not the sort of self-righteous independence that would be, quote, virtue in this sense. The opposite of sin is faith, in which one responds, you might say, appropriately to the call that comes to one. So faith is a kind of response. Faith is a passion. So I think faith is a virtue for Kierkegaard. It just turns out it's not a virtue that one can achieve all by oneself. It requires grace. It requires divine assistance in some way to achieve. In this podcast, we have had the discussion with both psychoanalysts and Jungian analysts around conscience and conscience role in yeah. the psychotherapeutic room. And I know that it was a very important concept for, for Kierkegaard. How does conscience fit into the Kierkegaardian depth psychology? Yeah, well, conscience is, you know, etym etymologically, conscience is knowing with. It's a... And, and for Kierkegaard, anybody who, has, anybody who has a conscience, when, you, when you're aware of conscience, you are actually aware of what we might call transcendence, or ultimately, if you have a clear enough understanding of it, God. So conscience is, for Kierkegaard, the voice of God. Now, he knows, of course, that the voice of God gets mixed with culture, 
and that there's a lot of noise, you might say, that, that, that distorts. Nevertheless, he's enough of a Platonist, I think. He talks about recollection here, that all of us in some way have an awareness of the, the kind of ideals, the, the good that we should, should be seeking. And so for Kierkegaard, conscience is, this is one, you know, there's a popular myth. I think it comes from Camus. The Kierkegaard thinks belief in God is something terribly intellectually risky and, and even crazy, that it takes a so-called leap of faith to believe in God. That's actually not Kierkegaard's view at all. He says believing in Christ requires a leap because the idea that God became a human being is so astoundingly unlikely and improbable that you would never be able to prove it or rationally justify it. It would only be motivated by some kind of deep awareness of your psychological needs uh, for Kierkegaard. So, so he, but God, an awareness of God, Kierkegaard actually says in one place that there has never been an atheist in all of human life, just people who refuse to allow what they know to gain power over their lives. Mm. So Kierkegaard actually doesn't think that it's hard. One of the reasons he's against the idea of proving God's existence is because if you think you have to prove God's existence, that shows you are ignoring God. God is already speaking to you. And if you think you need to prove that he's real, that shows that, that you are, so to speak. He compares to people who want to prove God. Suppose you were, he says, in the, in the presence of a very powerful king. And you came up to the king and said, oh, king, here I am. I'm going to prove that you exist. <laughs> the king would be insulted by that. And Kierkegaard says, so also we, quote, prove God's existence by worship, just as you would prove the king's existence by bowing <laughs> to him if you were in his presence. So Kierkegaard thinks that we're all, in a sense, in the presence of God. And that's why, for him, there is a kind of non-Christian religiosity that's important as well. I mean, he is a, a Christian, but he has this distinction between what he calls religion A and religion B. Religion A is a kind of spiritual life that's possible outside the confines of Christianity. And although he doesn't think it's the highest, he thinks it's a very deep and it's a, a, a type of life that deserves respect and, and honor because it, you might call it Socratic religiosity. It's the kind of religiosity that he thinks Socrates embodied. And for Kierkegaard, Socrates is always a hero, a model. At one point in one of his late writings, He's talking about Europe, and he says, what Europe needs today is a new Socrates. And he says, no, I'm well aware that Socrates was not a Christian. And then he says in parentheses, but I'm convinced he has long since become one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Oh. Well, when, just, just, uh, so when it comes to conscience in, in, in Kierkegaard's depth psychology, it would be yeah quite different from Freud's superego. It would not be limited to cultural norms and such, or, you know, parental exactly. ideology. Yeah. In fact, it's almost just the opposite. If it's exactly the voice of God that allows someone to become someone who's capable of standing up to and, and rejecting the cultural norms. Because remember, Kierkegaard is a relational thinker. So we don't invent our values out of nothing. They come from somewhere. And if they don't come from the culture, if you want to critique culture and say Socrates critiqued his culture, where, 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 from what basis do you do that? Mm -hmm. So for him, you might say an authentic conscience, as opposed to just what we might call a cultural conscience, is, is something that invo involves really, as I say, hearing this sort of call, which he mm -hmm. thinks we humans have the capacity to do, but most of us repress it. We, we block it. We, we don't pursue it. Hmm. Well, maybe staying a little bit with Freud and not his view on conscience, but Freud famously said that the purpose of analysis is to turn neurotic suffering and guilt into ordinary human misery or unhappiness. Yeah. And one of the purpose of analysis was also to help people to be able to mourn and, and grieve, grieve losses. Health would be to also be able to have guilt, but you know, the right type of guilt. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on Kierkegaard's understanding of guilt. Yeah, I think Kierkegaard thinks that there are two universal dimensions of human life that point in the direction of religion. 
One is suffering and one is guilt. And he thinks if you look at the world's religions, they're all attempts in some way to say, what is the meaning of suffering? How do, how do we deal with suffering? And what is the meaning of guilt? And how do we, how do we solve that, that meaning? And so, so for, for him, what we're tempted to do and what most of us do is to convert guilt into what we might call comparative guilt in which we sort of say, well, yes, I know I've done some bad things, but I'm better than most people, or I'm not like one of those people. And we, we sort of reassure ourselves that things are okay. But he thinks that the highest kind of, of human selves, the people who become Gandhis or Socrates, or don't, don't take that sort of cop out. They aren't content to be just like the others or a little better than the others. But they ask themselves, who could I be? What should I be? And they're willing to sort of pursue that in a fearless way. And the benefit of that, uh, if we were going to make a comparison with Freud, is Kierkegaard thinks it's possible to convert ordinary human suffering and guilt into joy. That because I can take all that happens to me, with guilt especially, Kierkegaard, I mean, his definition of faith is that if I have faith, I can rest rest transparently in the power that is the basis of the self. So I can rest. I, I, I won't be anxious in the wrong way. And I can be transparent. The great gift of forgiveness is that I no longer have to lie to myself about who I am, what I've done. So not that other religions don't have an answer or an attempted answer to the problem of guilt, but the Christian answer to the problem of guilt is the incarnation and the atonement, which allows me to have this wonderful sense that God loves me and accepts me just as I am. I don't have to earn or acquire the a value. So this, this, of course, is part of his Lutheran heritage here, for, for sure. But in, in terms of suffering, this, he has the sense that we should have faith that whatever happens to us even if it's only in eternity, these sufferings will, in the end, turn out for our good. That we will learn something from them. We will become somebody that we wouldn't have become. And that whatever suffering we have can, in, in the long run, be redeemed, be meaningful. So particularly, and, and I think, here I will, I'll just say, I think Kierkegaard's greatest book is his book, Works of Love. And it is a book that's also full of great psychological wisdom and insight. Great, great psychological wisdom. And so part of the call that we all each have is that we can always we can always engage the task of loving our neighbor. And, and our neighbor means everyone. We, we're not allowed to just love people who look like us or the same sex or the same religion or the same ethnic group or the same nationality. There's a, there's a sense in which I'm simply not allowed to, to draw the sort of us-them boundaries, which of course, the human race is famous for doing. You know, every tribe tends to, to mark their boundaries that way. You know, like, I have to treat the people like me well, but the, the other people, they're the bad. They're the enemies. They're the... For Kierkegaard, my task is to see what he calls the inner glory that is possessed by all humans, not, not just those who I naturally like or drawn to or attractive or who will do something to help me out. It's not a, a sort of a, a contract where I agree to be nice to other people if they'll be nice to me. Neighbor love, loving your neighbor for Kierkegaard does not, it welcomes reciprocity. It, it hopes that the other will love you in return, but it doesn't demand it or make that sort of reciprocal love a condition for love. So uh, that's a, a huge, a huge part. Kierkegaard thinks that we, we, it's a, we, we tend to think that being accountable is a bad thing. We fear accountability because we think of accountability mainly in terms of punishment. If I'm accountable, I screw up, someone's going to punish me. And, and so all the time we say, we're going to hold that politician accountable, meaning we're going to punish them or we're going to hold these people accountable. And so naturally we might think that being accountable to God is a fearsome thing, a bad thing. But for Kierkegaard, that's not the case. The true God is like the father of the prodigal son. If you know the parable of the prodigal son, this guy 
takes his father's inheritance, goes out, wastes it, lives terribly, comes back saying, well, I'm going to repent. But before he even has a chance to repent, the father welcomes him home and, and lavishes love. And for Kierkegaard, God is like that. And so in being accountable to a God like that is a gift because it means that our lives have a value and a meaning they wouldn't have otherwise. In the end, nothing we do for the good is lost. Even if we fail, humanly speaking, even if our efforts are unsuccessful, God sees, God remembers, God appreciates. And so everything that we do for the good has a kind of, of meaning. So accountability for Kierkegaard is a gift. It's, it's something that, and, uh, because, and, and of course, Kierkegaard's view, this is of course not a view that every Christian holds, but Kierkegaard doesn't think that God really punishes anyone. He thinks that he makes no appeal to heaven and hell as sort of external rewards and punishments in his account of faith, because God is loved through and through. And so even if God sends some sort of suffering into your path, it's not because God wants to get even with you or thinks you deserve it or wants you to suffer. It's because God realizes that you are trapped in evil and that the evil is making you misery. And God wants to... So what we call punishments, Kierkegaard calls God's medicine. And he says, if we really understood ourselves and understood God, we would not fear God's punishments. We would welcome his medicine because God, God has no, no enmity towards anyone. He is 100% love. That's why human neighbor love, if it wants to be like God's love, that's what it strives to be like. It doesn't mean that we can have tough love. It doesn't mean that we are pushovers for evil. Because allowing someone to do evil or to hurt somebody else, not only allowing them to hurt somebody else, they're hurting themselves. And so if you really want the good, to, to love someone in, by loving them as your neighbor, is to want what's their true good. And allowing, even if you allow someone to do what they want, but what they want is something destructive of them and their, of their true self, then you're not really loving them. was really happy both that you brought in your latest book and the question of accountability and how that fits in but also that you that you spoke a little bit of also my favorite book of Kierkegaard works of love and in that book Kierkegaard describes the role of the Christian as a beautic lover no yes yeah I was yeah. wondering if you could just stay a little bit with this book because as you said it's full of rich psychological insight a relational insight i'm not looking for you to give us sort of do this in a kicky guardian way but just to help us to speak a little bit more about love and how love heals yeah well love love he says well there, there's a paradox in the book on the one hand he says love must be blind because you mustn't allow a person's appearance to block you from loving them but he also says love must have wide open eyes <laughs> Because you must love the person you see, and you must love them as they are, not simply as you want them to be. If you don't start by loving someone as they are, you'll never help them become the person they could be. And so the important thing is you don't see other people as simply projects for you to remake. But ultimately, the role of the Mayunic lover is this. Ultimately, the potential to love is something that God puts into every individual. And so you must believe that love is already there, e in Danish, in the ground, in the foundation of the self. And so your job is to love forth love, to love this person in a way that allows the potential for love that's already there to, to be developed and come out. And this requires things like, he says, love believes all things. Well, not literally, I think, <laughs> believes all things, but love always attempts to find a mitigating explanation, to look at the work of the actions of others in the most charitable way possible. Rather, we so often demonize people and, and demonize their motives. And when we can't explain away or mitigate the evil someone does, then we must seek to forgive it. Forgiveness is also a, a work of, of love here, uh, very important. And here I would recommend, there's a wonderful book on forgiveness 
that's inspired by Kierkegaard by John, a man named John Lippitt, L-I-P-P-I-T-T, just a terrific book. Forgiveness as a Work of Love, I think it's called. It's from Oxford University Press. But best book on forgiveness I've ever read, full of real-life examples, too. It's an extremely powerful book. So love hopes for all things. It, it, it always believes and hopes for the good for everyone. And it really does think that in the end, no one is, is a hopeless case. Maybe in eternity, we'll be very shocked and surprised to find that the people who we would have thought were beyond redemption have, have, have in some way come, come to, to be the self that they could have been and should have been even in their earthly life. So, so that's part of what it means to be the myubic lover. It's to recognize that ultimately, I can't create or love or put love into the other, but I can love the other. And in so doing, I quote, love forth love and allow God, in a sense, who has implanted a love in the ground of that self to, uh, to work. Well, taking one step back again, I had something more I wanted to ask you about sin. When in Jung, we haven't spoken about much, Sigi Jung, but he said that the only evil is unconsciousness. The only evil is to be unconscious somehow. And, and mention in your book and in your books, I think that Kierkegaard agrees with Socrates that ignorance is sin. And you also write that Kierkegaard takes it further by saying that it's a willed self-deception and what Kierkegaard wants to trace evil back somehow to the will, that evil has to do with the human will. Could you say something more about this ignorance as sin? and? This is the self-deception. Sure. Yeah. Of course, when he says ignorance is sin, he doesn't mean all ignorance is sin. I mean, there is there there is innocent forms of ignorance. Mm. Uh, we are finite creatures, and it's not possible for us to... There is, I think, there are parts of the self that are opaque to the self because we're just finite and we can't know everything there is about us. So for Kierkegaard, the, the, the part of the self that is problematic is what we might call the dynamic unconscious. It's, it's the unconscious that we don't want to or recognize, not simply the part that's just too big or too vast or that we can't know everything about ourselves. So, so he does want to say that in some sense, the Greeks, he thinks, if you look at Plato, you look at Aristotle, look at Socrates, they have a lot of trouble explaining evil. Socrates, in the, in the end, wants to say evil just is ignorance because he thinks, he thinks if you understood yourself, you would recognize that if you do evil, you've hurt yourself more than you hurt the other. And who wants to hurt themselves? And so Socrates says, if you do evil, it shows you must be ignorant. And so sin, sin is ignorance on the Socratic view. Kierkegaard says that's right as far as it goes. But he says that there's a dimension of volition that Socrates, he says Socrates is too Greek, too, too innocent <laughs> to recognize that some of, some of the ignorance is a willed ignorance. And that, that, that volitional element, he thinks that's something that you might say the Christian view of the self adds to the Greek view of the self. And so the Christian says, yes, maybe sin is ignorance sometimes, uh, but if so, we must say, well, why are we ignorant? And sometimes we are ignorant because we, we want to be, because we refuse. And he even describes what that process is like, you know, how we can, in a sense, forget things that we that we know we uh, we turn our attention away or we distract ourselves we we do all kinds of things so i may maybe i i i don't want to see a, a beggar when i'm on my way home and it makes me feel guilty so i go a different way mm. and then i'm not confronted and so i in a way i'm unaware of the beggar's claim on me but but in another way i am aware because it's shown by the fact that i avoided <laughs> going home that way. So there is a, a kind of awareness that's un underneath my, my ignorance. So that's, that's important. Of course, Kierkegaard does think that there is a kind of, also a kind of what he calls demonic evil, mm -hmm. not just ignorance, where in a sense we actually embrace what's evil. 
consciously, clear-headedly, even embracing our own destruction. And one can imagine things like that in, in the human self, but he thinks they're rare. I think that's a rare. Most of us, most of us aren't up to that. We, <laughs> we're too, we're too weak to be demonic. I was just thinking before we spoke in shortly about Luther and Luther's inspiration on, on Kierkegaard, and, and Luther was, yeah, he was the devil was very much alive for him in his life and yeah. his writing. How was it for for for, for Kierkegaard and the devil? I mean, you see. What's this view on? Kierkegaard doesn't talk of him like Luther does about the devil, and, uh, but I don't think he would deny that there are sort of demonic forces, that there are powers, you might say, whether those, whether we, we want to personify those and think of them as persons, but there are, there are, you might say, there are powers that push us towards evil that are not just, you know, instincts or things within ourselves, but they, they are embedded maybe in social structures. And maybe there are indeed some supernatural, as I say, Kierkegaard doesn't, unlike Luther, he doesn't talk very much about the devil, but yeah. but the devil does function for him as a kind of model. If you could clear-headedly, consciously embrace evil, that would be demonic evil. And so Satan would be sort of the model. So even if Satan isn't a, a literal figure for him, He's a kind of, you might say, mythical archetype <laughs> yeah. that, that helps us understand because we, we do see certain individuals as, as you might say, approaching that. You, you see in Kierkegaard's writings, he sometimes sketches literary figures who approach this kind of demonic evil. For example, in Fear and Trembling, he discusses Richard, is it Richard the Third or the Second Shakespeare play? who is deformed, physically deformed, but rather than, in a sense, humbling himself under this and accepting and learning to love himself as he is, he becomes a monster. It's sort of like, my anger at myself is going to be turned into anger at the at existence in the world. And Kierkegaard, I think, was tempted in that direction himself. And one, of, I think one of the most poignant lines in all of Kierkegaard, he says, is this, he says, what love for God it takes to allow oneself to be healed when one has been bungled from the start. Mm -hmm. When you have been messed up, when you've had a terrible upbringing, when, when you have been the butt of the other children, uh, Kierkegaard was not physically, he was, some people even thought he was a hunchback. He was not an attractive, if you've seen some of the pictures of Kierkegaard, they're very stylized. They mm -hmm. probably don't reflect his actual appearance. And he was very sensitive to, to this. And even as a child, he, he had a bitter a kind of biting whip. His schoolmates nicknamed him the fort because he liked to stick it to people. He, he took his revenge on the, you know, the teasing and the, all the terrible things that the other children called him by mm -hmm. using his intelligence to against them. So I think as an adult, he he had to work very hard at, at sort of learning to love and and not becoming this sort of bitter, angry person who was angry about for example, he he could have been really angry at his father. He thinks his father totally brought him up in the wrong way, gave him a terrible dose of anxiety and guilt as a young child, such that no child should have to bear. Kierkegaard thought that Christian upbringing shouldn't be like that, that a child should be brought up as a child and what he called the, the stern Christian concepts of guilt and forgiveness and the atonement should be left for older years. But that didn't happen to him. And he, he felt he was in many ways a victim of that upbringing. But instead of sort of being angry or bitter his father, he loved his father. And he said, I'm going to try to make myself the person I, and thereby, I'm going to be not only saving myself, but saving my father. I'm going to redeem my father's upbringing. I think it was a sort of noble and magnanimous response to a rather difficult childhood. Well, I think rereading your your book or one of your books, something that really struck me again was how Kierkegaard speaks about human about the recovery 
that this process of light or process of development is a process of recovering something. And how he speaks of that self-realization, for example, it can so easily today become, yeah, again, an achievement. But, but this simple insight that uh, the realization that you have a self, that there is a self, uh, there is something back to me again, reading your works and how, how important that perspective of yeah, recovery seems to be in Kierkegaard, maybe also for us as yeah. practicing therapists. But recovery, recovery for him always requires a kind of honesty about the problem. You can't recover if you aren't aware of the problem. You, you have to sort of, and so why does he write so much about guilt and about suffering? Because you can't, you can't really solve those problems if you don't honestly face them. And, and that's important. So what, what he loves about religiousness, A, is that it may not have all the answers, but at least it honestly looks at, at the, the issues, the questions. Would you also write in your book that for Kierkegaard, the goal of selfhood is, is to make true community possible. Many people think of Kierkegaard or some, some of people think of him, him as a radical individualist, maybe, or become who you are. But you're really emphasizing that the goal of selfhood in his work is to, to make true community possible. Could you elaborate on that? Well, it's, it's really implied by the fact that he has, in sickness unto death, this relational view of the self. That is, we can only become ourself by relating ourselves to ourselves, but we always do that by relating to another. And Kierkegaard, it's not that Kierkegaard is blind to the influence of humans, of uh, social structures, of parents. or In, in fact, he has a, an acute consciousness of how we are shaped that way. And so he's asking himself, is it possible to go beyond merely being a product of, of your parents and your society? And it's only if there is another to relate to uh, beyond society or higher than society. So transcendence is the, you might say, the, the offers the possibility of authenticity, of being something. And he does think also, since for him, God is personal, that God creates humans as individuals, not simply as members of a species. That I think, to use philosophical language, Kierkegaard is a follower of, of John Dunn Scotus here. He has a sort of Scotistic view of the self. Scotus thought that in addition to the human nature that all humans have, that there is also something like an individual nature, an, es an individual essence. Sometimes philosophers call these hexaides. And I think there's a direct connection between Scotus and the Franciscans and Luther and Kierkegaard. And he inherits this sort of strongly individualistic tradition. He gets it partly from the, from the pietists too, also, who are always talking about the idea that it's not enough to believe in God, but it must be your God. I must believe in my God, a God who is in some sense connected to me and my mm. individuality. So Kierkegaard very strongly holds to this idea of, of, the, of the individual. But that's where he gets the reputation of being individuals. But if you ask, who, what does it mean to be an authentic individual? It's to be someone who realizes that my, my destiny is to love and to love God and to love my neighbor. But if I do that, we will have an ideal community. In Works of Love, Kierkegaard says, in time, we will never have a perfect equality. There will always be inequalities. There will always be differences. Some people will always have more money. Some people will always have more power. Some people will always have more influence. But he thinks that the person who really has neighbor love must somehow rise above all this and recognize the humanity, the value of everyone, regardless of their status in society, and, and have a kind of respect. Kierkegaard himself actually tried to practice this when, for much of his life, he spent two or three hours a day walking the streets of Copenhagen, and he made a point of what he did, of talking to people from all social classes. In fact, this was regarded as a sort of shocking thing for someone who was from an upper class, he was rich and educated, to actually converse as an equal with people from the lower classes. Hmm. Well, coming from the political aspect back to the clinical room, could you imagine 
Kierkegaard as a therapist or as a counselor. How would you imagine, or like, what comes to your mind? If you look, for example, at some of his letters to his nieces and nephews, in, in one place, someone wrote to him who was suffering from depression, and we, what we would call depression. And Kierkegaard basically gives us this advice. He says, when I have these feelings, I deal with them by exercise. I walk. I take, and, and I take what he called people baths. And he says, I walk away my troubles. And I, he recommended to this woman that she try walking. Well, that's pretty good advice. Exercise is known to be a, a help to people suffering from depression. Also, I'll just tell you one anecdote. Kierkegaard had a kind of Rorschach test. When he had guests, he had a, a quite a collection of coffee mugs, and they were all unique, and they would be displayed on the wall, and someone would sit down for coffee, and Kierkegaard would say, would you please choose a mug? And then when the person chose the mug, Kierkegaard would say, now why did you choose that mug? <laughs> As a way of, of getting to know this person and mm. sort of getting to understand their, their individuality, what they were about. So, mm. And, and Kierkegaard, I think, was quite capable of, of, of intense sort of other directed conversation of, of focusing on he, his, his nieces and nephews adored him. They thought he was wonderful, that he was able to give them a sense that, that they, they were the center of the universe when he talked to them. Mm. So I think he had some of the skills that would have been good for therapists, but maybe he would have been a wounded healer because he certainly had his fear of scars, and, but he wouldn't have been the first <laughs> therapist. But I, I guess the, the thing I would say, the things that Kierkegaard would want to say would be the things that you see in works of love, where he talks about believing all things, hoping all things, loving the person as you see them. All, all those, all those aspects, I think, would be would be part of what we might call. And and I do think Kierkegaard would have been a, what we might call a meiotic analyst or a meiotic therapist. That is, he would have thought, in the end, I shouldn't think of this person as simply a project for me to manipulate, because this person is a sort of free human being and they have a self. And my task is to be a, a midwife to help them become the self they were meant to be. Mm -hmm.